<laughs> um, congrats on a big summer of running. It sounds like uh, you've got a few races under the belt and one more big one to go. Tell me about that. One more to go, yes. So I decided sort of last minute on very minimal training to attempt to Grand Slam. Um, okay. So initially, uh, before Vermont 100 canceled, I was considering doing it and then I was kind of injured. I had sort of like a hip injury that was kind of nagging me and I was going to physical therapy for it. And so I was kind of on the fence. And then when Vermont canceled, I was like, okay, I'm not going to do it. But then Burning River stepped in as a sort of um, alternative to yeah. Vermont 100. Yeah. And so at the last minute, I accepted my old Dominion invite. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, I actually figured Old well, Dominion has a 28 hour cutoff. I'm sort of slow. I'm on the back end. So <laughs> I kind of assumed I would fail at Old Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> but I finished with 15 minutes to spare. Nice. Okay. And so then on to Burning River, which looked a lot easier on paper. Um, <laughs> had you done but, either of these two races before? I had not, no. Oh, sweet. Okay. So that's new experiences. New experiences. Cool. Definitely. Um, I expected Burning River to be just really hot and mm. it's in Ohio, so in July, but mm. it ended up being quite rainy, muddy, and lots of thunderstorms. So it was just a slog to the finish there. Um, I mean, I wasn't really concerned about not finishing, but we only had maybe 30 minutes left before the cutoff there. Okay. And then that brought me to Leadville, which. <laughs> So is a, a running race. Um, <laughs> and so I was really nervous going in. I was definitely thinking I might not finish. Um, but I was actually more concerned about getting cut off going into Twin Lakes because they shortened the cutoff by 30 minutes this year. Right. And then I made it with a whole hour. So then huh. I wasn't as concerned. But then um, after Hope Pass, I really started struggling with breathing and I slowed way down and especially the climb up power line was murderously slow. So, <laughs> um, that put me very close to the cutoff. Um, we had less than three minutes. So, <laughs> um, 2956 and some change, it looks like. So, and I was there at the finish and I saw you cross the finish line and I want to get into all that. I want to hear all about it, but, um, let's go back. If you don't mind, like, don't how, mind did, how did this start for you, Gina? Like, I don't really know, um, your history. Uh, I know when I met you, I knew that you were like a badass mountain chick that had done a whole bunch of races. And that was really all I knew. And today I looked at your ultra sign up and it does look like you've got a whole bunch of races. But how did this all start for you? Like, where did you grow up? How did you get into running? Um, so I grew up in Massachusetts. Um, I lived out east for a very long time. Um, I moved out to Colorado in 2006. What so for? I went, uh, I moved out here for work. Okay. And you're a scientist? Yeah. So I'm a chemist. Uh, mm. I started off in the pharmaceutical industry and then... Um, I moved out here for a job for a startup company called Array Biopharma in Longmont. Um, they eventually were bought out, but we went through several cycles of layoffs. And then I finally decided to jump ship after the second or third layoff. I, I think it was the third one. Um, so I moved to National Renewable Energy Lab where I work now, um, doing something totally completely different. I do combustion chemistry uh, for gasoline and diesel engines, um, moving into sort of jet engine work now. So oh, wow, totally different than pharmaceuticals, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> life's a journey. You never know where it's going to take us. Definitely. Um, and as far as starting running, I kind of dabbled in short things like five K's until I was about 30. And then I ran my first marathon, um, which I trained religiously for for six months um and yep. completed <laughs> and then I about a year later the girl I trained with was like hey I really want to do this other marathon in Utah the St. George because it's really pretty 
And she's like, would you train and run another marathon with me? And I was like, you know, sure. It wasn't too bad running a marathon, no problem. Uh, so we went out and did that one. And then maybe six months later, it was like coming up to my birthday and my ex-husband's brother was running a marathon in Green Bay on my birthday. So I was like, hey, let's go out and visit your brother and I'll run a marathon in Green Bay. Nice. I think and I've run that one. <laughs> oh, have you? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I'm from Wisconsin. So I've run a bunch of them in Wisconsin. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed the end of that because you get to run out on the field. And Mambo field. Of- yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and then after that, someone at work was like, oh, you've run, you know, three marathons in three different states. Has anyone ever run a marathon in every state? And I was like, I don't know. Let's go to Google. So we looked, <laughs> it, we looked it up and there's like a whole club that does the 50 state marathon. Um, so I decided to kind of endeavor on that. Okay. Um, and it took me about four and a half years to get through all the 50 states. Okay. Um, and... My 50th one I wanted to do as Boston Marathon in my hometown. Um, so in 2013, I was attempting to finish, but there was the Boston Marathon bombing. Oh. So I actually was about 0.5 or so miles from the finish, kind of on the last two turns um, when the race got stopped and everyone was kind of running out towards us and it was really confusing and it was like mass chaos um and my whole family was there so that was like a pretty emotional uh, holy crap so you guys were really close yeah so my parents actually were about i mean they were right at the second bomb they were in the building right where the second bomb was placed um fortunately they were inside still and so they were protected, even though like the glass all got blown out and everything, um, they were protected because they weren't actually out into the, in the foyer area. Mm-hmm. Um, but they did, you know, witness some kind of devastation in that area. Yeah, so I bet it was rough for them. And of course, I didn't know what was happening. Um, we started to get information like, you know, there were bombs that went off and, I had no idea if they were alive or not. You couldn't get a phone call out. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was kind of just really scary and emotional for a good 45 minutes or so. Um, Then I was finally able to get a text through to them and get a reply that they were okay. And we eventually got reunited several hours later. Um, And then a year later, I went back in 2014 and finished it. (laughs) Holy cow. (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty legit start to your running career right there. So, yeah. okay. So I want to go back just a little bit. I want to come back to where we are now, but going back just a little bit, like what were your thoughts going into your first marathon? Were you, it sounds like you may have been running it with a friend. So was it just like, Oh, uh, we're going to train for this thing together. We're going to go out and run it. Or like, where was your head at that point? And did you have any idea that, you know, you were going to get into running as, as a, as a long-term hobby as a long, long-term sport to follow? No, honestly, we were like, Hey, I've always wanted to run a marathon. Uh-huh. And it was a girlfriend I worked with. Um, she sat across from me. Her name was Carrie Grace. Um, And so she, you know, I I had gone out and done a half marathon and she said, I really wanted to do a marathon, but I've never had anyone who would train with me. Like, would you go run a marathon with me? And I said, sure. You know, and we're like looking up training plans. We're like, okay, we need something about six months from now. We're going to train together. We're going to do everything right. Um, You know, as a new runner, having no idea what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we looked up Boulder back roads was like five and a half months away. So we picked that one. Um, and then we trained every single weekend. We went out and did our like long run on Sunday and just increased by two miles every week. Yep. And, uh, we, we do like shorter runs on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, mm. but yeah, we, we trained very hard for that. And I was still really nervous. I remember not sleeping the night before. Right being really scared yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. going to be able to finish this race. I know. That's how my first marathon was. I'm like, you know, I know a lot of people have done this, but I've read that people have actually died in a marathon. So I hope I don't die tomorrow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. Where is Carrie Grace now? Are you still friends with her? So she actually was one of the people that was laid off um, when I worked at Array and I, 
you know, I'm still friends with her on Facebook, but she doesn't really post to Facebook. I haven't talked to her in quite a while now. Um, I'm we just did curious. See each other like, times I wonder her, what, though. I wonder what she thinks of you now. Like she is the one that got all this started and now you're off doing all these insane ultra marathons. Like, I just wonder if she knows what she did. <laughs> I, you know, I should have reached out to her. I'm going to do that after this. Just totally. send her a message yeah. and see how she's doing. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Um, so 50 marathons in 50 states, that's a pretty big endeavor in itself. I mean, had you heard of ultra marathons at this point? Um, yeah. So I definitely, you know, had read about, I read Dean Karnazes' book. So I knew about Western states and, and stuff like that. But I never imagined that I would ever be able to complete 100 miles. So at this time, it was completely out of my mind. Um, after the Boston Marathon bombing happened, I was like kind of just really shaken up for a little bit after that because it was just, I had worked a really long time toward this and it was like the final race and yeah. I didn't get to count it. And, you know, I, I said, I need something like really positive and like difficult to focus on. So I think I should try running 50 miles. Like, why not? Um, the same year? So it was in the same year. Same year. Nice. So I look up a couple of races and I find maybe this race that seems not too difficult for 50 miles. Um, it was the Rainier to Ruston race. And I have a, a really close girlfriend of mine that lives out in Portland. So I reached out to her and I said, hey, I'm thinking about trying 50 miles. And she's like, what? Really? And I said, yeah, you know, there's this race kind of near you. Would you, if I flew out there, would you come support me, help me, like pace me during the race? So she, of course, agreed because she's amazing. Um, and that was how I ran 50 miles. <laughs> and I'll be honest, at the end of that, I thought I was going to die. I'm like, this right. is the worst thing I've ever done. <laughs> what was I thinking? Okay, well, I've done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So like, are you throwing up? Are you walking half this thing? Like, what was your first 50 miler like? You know, I, the first part is kind of trail. It's, it's more downhillish. And so I was, you know, kind of running all that portion. But then the last 20 miles is kind of more pavement. And so once I got on the pavement, I was like, oh, man, you know, everything just hurts a lot more. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> going from the soft trail to the pavement is terrible. Totally. Yeah. Um, and yeah, near the end, I started getting a little nauseous because it was pretty hot. Hmm. Um, I didn't actually end up throwing up, but I definitely did not feel good. And we were slowed down quite a bit where I was just kind of doing a run walk toward the end. Um, but we, I think I finished in like 11 and a half or 11.45, something like that. So it wasn't horrible, but it wasn't ah. you know great or anything. Yeah, it's great for your first 50 miler. But I definitely was saying to myself, okay, I did it. That's awesome. Okay. You know, I don't even know when I decided to try a hundred. It might've been a few weeks after that when I was like, you know, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what was your first hundred miler? Um, it's, it's in Pennsylvania. It's, uh, the Pine Creek challenge. So at that point, when you signed up for that race, had you like gone to crew or pace at a hundred miler or was this whole thing just completely new to you? Completely new. Yeah. Um, I Googled the search term I Googled was easiest hundred miler. And that came up because it's a rail trail. So huh. you can't get lost. <laughs> I was most concerned about getting lost in the dark uh -huh. while running. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Valid concern. <laughs> Uh, okay. And, um, so that was a point to point hundred miler. It has like two little out and back sections, but yeah, you kind of like, there's one sort of out and back and then you come and do a longer out and back. So you do pass by several people kind of on their way in. Like I remember seeing the guy who was winning a couple times hmm. and I was cheering him as he came by me and I'm like, oh, you're in first place. That's awesome. And he was like, enjoy the journey as he's running by me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and then were you hooked after that or what was, what was the thought process after that? Well, um, I definitely had no idea what I was doing. Um, I wasn't prepared for 
being up overnight, I got really, really tired. Um, and I was kind of like death marching, just falling asleep, walking. Mm -hmm. And even though I was trying to take a little bit of caffeine, like I just, I had no clue what I was doing. I'm sure I didn't eat enough. Um, Mm -hmm. but we still did like, I finished sub 24, believe it or not, like just barely, but it was, you know, I, I kind of stuck with it. I was doing this run walk sort of strategy Mm -hmm. the whole way. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere around four or five in the morning, or maybe it was three in the morning, I was death marching and we get to this last aid station. And he's like, you know, if you can do the last four and a half miles in like less than an hour, you know, or an hour and five minutes, you'll be sub 24. And I remember just looking at my pacer and saying, okay, let's go. (laughs) And and she's looking at me like, okay, are we run walking again? I was like, yes, we have to make it. And <laughs> I think I made it, it was like 2355 or something. Ah, like that. Beautiful. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love those moments when, you know, you are that close to the finish and you've been dead for hours. You, you know, you're the walking dead for four or six hours, eight hours all night long. And then suddenly, you know, the person behind you, you hear them catching up to you, or, you know, that there's a, a cutoff coming up and all of a sudden you have this new energy. It just comes out of nowhere. And bam. All of a sudden you can just take off. And uh, I love that. Those are the, like the moments that I live for. Yeah. Uh, it's the best feeling. It really is. Um, but after I finished it, I did say, well, I did it. I ran a hundred miles. I can't believe it, but no, I'm not doing this again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how long did that last? Not very long. Um, <laughs> a little bit later, I then looked at the Western States website and was like, oh, they have a specific list of qualifiers. I could run this race called Rocky Raccoon mm-hmm. in Texas. And that's a qualifier. I have to try once to qualify for Western. So yeah. I'll go run Rocky, see how that goes. And then I can at least put into the lottery. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that. And then of course, then once you're in the lottery and you start getting tickets, it's like, oh, I have to keep going. Got to keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you ran Western, right? I did in 2019. So how long did it take you to get in? Five years. Five years. Uh, that's yeah. persistence. Yeah. Are yeah. you um, adamant about putting your, your tickets in for hard rock as well? Is that a race that's on your list? Yeah. So I think I'm at eight years this time around. Okay. Um, it's, it's seven or eight. I'm not sure. But of course, like, I think the two years they didn't hold the lottery, no one's gaining tickets. Yeah. So I'll either have five or six years of hard rock tickets. Okay. Do you still put in for Western States every year? I have. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I only have two tickets this time. So yeah. not, not a very good chance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite race? I mean, you've done a lot of them. Do you have a favorite? Uh, I mean, I've done like a huge variety of races. Um, Seems like it. I know you've done some, you know, overseas, you've been all over the place. Yeah. I would say euphoria, which is in Andorra. It's kind of this little tiny principality between France and Spain. Um, there was a multi-day race I did there. Um, you have to do it as a team. So I ran it with John Sharp, um, in 2019 actually. And that was definitely just like the most scenic and beautiful race ever. And it's just, it, you know, it was four days of running with minimal sleep. Um, but it was definitely super challenging. There's 66,000 feet of climbing. It's like 148 miles. Nice. Um, okay. Amazing though. It was like, it, it was a really great experience. So is, is it a stage race? Um, they have like life stations you can stop and sleep at. There's, I think, four of them. So we were sleeping about an hour and a half a night. And then mm-hmm. we'd just go back out. Um, and then somewhere when we get really tired, we just pick, like, they have a lot of refuges. Like you just sleep in one of those or Mm -hmm. on the side of the trail or something for a few Mm -hmm. minutes. Um, but it took us, I think like 106 hours and we maybe slept seven hours total or something like that. It wasn't a lot. Wow. Wow. And are you eating at, uh, like restaurants along the way or is it aid station food or what does this look like? 
Yeah, they have eight stations. Um, we had drop bags that we had along the way. And then the little refuge places, like a lot of times you can buy like a Coke or some food there. So we were eating at those. Mm. And those were kind of like a little treat. You know, we'd say, oh, here's a refuge. This is awesome. <laughs> like we can get something <laughs> to eat here. <laughs> um, wow. What is uh, one of the more challenging races you've done, I guess, then? Um, I mean, probably the most difficult race, I did do a loop at Barkley. Um, uh. So, yeah, that is definitely crazy. I <laughs> did not think I would finish by any stretch, but I you wanted finished to a loop? try. <laughs> you finished a loop? I finished a loop. I nice. started a second loop. Um, uh. And then there was no way we were probably going to make it in on time for the second loop. So we did end up taking a quitter's way down. Um, uh. But you know, at least I got out there and I did go all the way around one loop. Um, I mean, props for someone from Colorado who doesn't live out there that gets to study that course all the time. Like I am intimidated of that course because I've never been out there. I've never got a chance to, to get out there and take a look at it. It's something I would want to scout before I, I took a crack at it. I had a buddy who, uh, you know, he's a legit 200 mile dude. He's done a bunch of 200s and won a handful of them. And he, he was telling me about the Barkley and he's like, I went out there. I couldn't even finish a loop. It was just the most ridiculous thing ever. So hats off, even if it's just one loop. Yeah, I did. Um, I had done the fall classic, which is on the, the mostly the trails you get to do like rat jaw and some other off trail sections um, during the fall classic. So I was familiar with the park from that. Um, you can't really scout the off trail sections per se. That's like kind of against the rules. Right. I shouldn't say kind of it, it is against the rules. <laughs> um, but I did do a lot of studying like the topo maps and, um, Google earth images and a lot of other things. And I took a ton of past race reports and other things I could find and kind of piece together how I thought it might be to do a loop. Mm -hmm. um, and Nick Holland was my coach for that race. So when I sent him my drawn out idea of what it could be, he told me that I had a like a 90 plus percent accuracy just based on what I could find out there for information. So I actually was kind of proud of that. <laughs> how did he know that? Um, Nick, is, Nick is a finisher. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. And so um, the other thing I did was, I think you you probably know Sherpa John. He yep. does this uh, Nye Watts race, and I Nye had Watts. done that. Okay. And uh, I, you know, I had done some navigating at night on his course, um, which he, you know, he was okay with me doing. And so I had a lot of practice just kind of using my compass and not being mm. able to see kind of where I was going. And that was really helpful because believe it or not, like your compass is always right. Um, your intuition is not right. And you always think, oh, well, I hear this sound or this looks this way. But if you trust your compass and you follow it, you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm guessing you've been lost a couple of times. Yes. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I've been lost a few times too, with and without a compass. Um, when I first moved to Colorado, I didn't know how to read a compass or a map. So I had to go take a class and I took a class, uh, up in Estes and, uh, this lady taught me a bunch of stuff. You know, we, we looked at a map a long time. She taught me how to use the compass. And then she put a blindfold on me and drove me out into the middle of the woods. And she's like, okay, you got to tell me how to get out of here. And it was, you know, it was cool. I, I, I learned a lot from her. Um, have you had That's some awesome. Have you had some scary, uh, some scary moments when you've been lost in the woods or, uh, tell me about that. Well, I was not lost alone. So that was the good thing. Okay. Um, I, a friend of mine from Colorado Springs, Chris, uh, she, she went out with me and did these crazy night adventures. Um, and we did get lost and then we ended up, you know, kind of looking at the map and saying, okay, if we take this compass bearing, we'll hit you know, this backstop, and then we can use this to get to the trail and get out. And it worked. So that was a good thing. But yeah, we were not exactly sure where we were, but you know, we weren't so completely lost that we couldn't figure it out. So that yeah. was a good thing. Good, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're just immersed deep into this ultra running world at this point. Like what's the longest race you've done up till now? Have you done any 200s? Uh, 
Vol State. I, okay. That's like 314. Yeah. Okay. And um, how long did that take? Oh, I'd have to look back. Seven days and something. Um, that one. That one's in July in Tennessee. That's it's so hot. It was wow. terrible. I had the worst heat rash ever. Um, but I we were doing an average of forty something miles a day still. So it was we were still moving pretty good. Yeah. Um, kind of three of us stayed together toward near the end, um, and then we were realizing it was probably going to take us a little longer. And so I had messaged my boss and said, "Hey, can I you know extend my vacation?" And he was kind of like, no. <laughs> You're um, messaging your boss from the trail? Yes. And so I was like, oh, no, no. Okay. So I guess I better finish on time. Um, <laughs> so I ended up kind of going ahead and like leaving the other, the other two guys. And I felt really bad about that. But it was just kind of like, why is my boss telling me I can't? extend my vacation. So then I was worried I was going to get laid off or something, um, which actually was almost the case. I got back to find out that our group was out of funding. And so they were transferring me to someone else effective, you know, that day. So <laughs> I uh, got back to find that out, which was kind of a bummer. And did they have any idea what you were up to? Um, no, no, he definitely knew I was running a race, but I think he wanted to tell me in person Okay. that I was being transferred. So yeah. Yeah. it was kind of like, I felt like he was almost, I mean, not crying, but he was really emotional about it because I think he, he knew um, the group I was being transferred to wasn't, you know, my ideal um, work situation. So um, eventually I worked for that group for about nine months and then I was able to come back once our funding was in a better place. So that was great, but. Okay, okay. So it all worked out. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, and then the Grand Slam this year. What what was the seed in your mind? For, like, how did that all start? Well, in 2019, I actually considered doing the Grand Slam because I got into Western States and I also had been chosen in the Leadville lottery. Huh. Um, so I was planning on it, but then like euphoria was an option. And so I was like, I would much rather have the opportunity to do euphoria. Yeah. So I said, I'll defer my Leadville entry. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe someday if I want to do the Grand Slam, I'll run Old Dominion in the place of Western because getting back into Western probably won't be easy. Mm -hmm. um, so I deferred Leadville and then did euphoria instead. Right. And then in 2020, I was like, okay, here we go. I'll do old Dominion. And then of course, you know how 2020 went. Um, mm -hmm. Basically everything got canceled. So then it was like, I spent the pandemic working from home, doing a lot of sitting, not really doing any running. Um, so <laughs> I got a little lazy. Um, As we all did, Gina. <laughs> <laughs> but you must not have gotten that lazy if you're running 400 milers this year. I mean... <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, I really wasn't sure. I mean, going into Old Dominion, I was like, I haven't run a distance like this in two years. I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, but apparently your body doesn't forget. So um, well, you must have done some training before Old Dominion. Had you done like yeah. any long runs or where were you at? Um, I wasn't doing anything that long. Honestly, I was doing mostly walking because of my hip. Um and I was running maybe five to six miles at a time, but I hadn't done anything over 10 miles in, in a really long time. Okay. <laughs> so um, in between, I had some hiking because I did finish the 58 14ers. And so I did that during oh. 2020 when everything else oh, perfect wasn't time happening. For that. So. Cool. <laughs> How many did you do last year? Um, I only had what, six, I think. Okay. Yeah. I only had the six to finish it out and it was mostly in the San Juan. So I yep. made a few trips out there to knock those out. Nice. Well, that's another big goal. That's a good one. Yeah. It was, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your story is kind of similar to mine. Do you ever sit and think about where you were like 10, 12, 15 years ago before you were a runner? Like it, it seems like you've come just such a long ways. Yeah, no, definitely. I, a lot of times I think back and I'm like, oh, remember the time when I thought like I could never even run a hundred miles and now I've done, 
you know, some really tough ones, um, some really crazy multi-day things. Um, but it really, you know, I had a lot of opportunities to do some great stuff just from getting more in shape and doing a lot of running and like just multi-day, like even hiking. Um, we did the El Camino de Santiago in 2018. I mean, that was amazing experience, you know, just yeah. to be able to like do the pilgrimage and, yeah. you know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. A lot of fun stuff. <laughs> um, I mean, do you ever think about like what your why is? Like, why do I do all this crazy stuff? Um, I mean, is it like, you know, how like a lot of ultra runners have demons that they're running from, or they have some weird trauma in their past? Do you ever think about that? Yeah, to some degree. I mean, I do, I work a lot. Um, one thing I do like about running or even just getting outdoors is just to kind of like decompress and, you know, spend some time by myself. Um, cause I do like, you know, to have that downtime, uh, so running is sort of that, I, I know a lot of people use running as like a group thing and they run in big groups. I actually prefer either being just one-on-one -on -one with someone or just kind of by myself where yeah. I can just clear my head and, and just enjoy the beauty outside and, yeah. you know, breathe the fresh air and not be sitting at my desk on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. That works. Um, okay. So in between these races this year, are you doing any running or training or is it just strictly recovery until the next race comes up? I did do between Old Dominion and Burning River. I was definitely running, like upping my mileage in, during the weeks and just trying to like kind of maybe maintain my weight, get a little, a few more pounds off just to make things a little easier. Um, so, in, but I had a lot of time in between Old Dominion's the beginning of June and then uh, burning rivers at the end of July. So there was like kind of this nice break where I had time to train, yep. but then from July and the July to, um, Leadville, I think it's only four weeks. So I only did a couple of shorter things. I, I did actually one 20 mile day just to, uh, get some, uh, elevation training and, you know, some uphill training, but between Leadville and Wasatch, there's 20 days. Um, so I had a three hour massage last night and Whoa. I've been doing a lot of rolling, stretching, um, just trying to get everything to feel good. Um, yeah. luckily my feet did really well at Leadville. I didn't have any blisters or anything like that. So my feet were in great condition, but I was definitely a little sore in the hips and everything after Leadville. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that uh. massage was great and a lot of recovery stuff. <laughs> a three hour massage. God, that sounds amazing. <laughs> um so like looking back to my early ultras i'm guessing it was the same for you like i had to train really hard to get up to that certain level where you can run 100 miles and then after a while after you've done a handful of them it seems like you can just kind of coast and you can just sign up for leadville with almost no training and i did one 20 mile run before this and, and that was it like is that is that how it was for you do you feel like you can just kind of uh, hike, run these things and get them done under the cutoff or, or where are you at? Yeah. I mean, it was definitely like that prior to taking like a two year hiatus with, uh, COVID and everything. Mm. But I would say like when I went into old dominion, I was probably pretty well rested. So I didn't, you know, suffer too terribly. Um, and with 28 hours, that's actually pretty tight for me. I, I tend to run more in the, like, especially if there's a lot of climbing. Um, I'm pretty good power hiking. I'm not really a strong runner though. I'll run downhill, I'll run some flats, but I do a lot of walking. So something like Leadville with 30 hour cutoff is, is tight for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew I'd have to run a lot and I knew I'd have to run a lot at Old Dominion. And so I was running definitely places I didn't want to, but you know, it was not uncomfortable. Leadville was uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> you were pretty close at Leadville. So yeah. what, what was your plan, plan going into that race? Did you know that you were going to be up a, against those cutoffs? And did you plan on staying close to those in order to finish this thing under the 30 hours? Yeah. So I had run in 2015. So I kind of had an idea of, you know, where I should be at. And I was, you know, hoping to go a little bit faster than I did in 2015. 
I finished in 2835 in 2015 because my second half actually went a lot better than this mm. time around. And so I don't know if it was a combination of just going out a little too hard or if there was smoke or dust or something, but okay. I noticed after the first climb of Hope Pass went really well. Like I felt like I was power hiking strongly. I was passing some people, um, breathing totally fine. And then I crested the top, started coming down and everything felt actually pretty good. I ran down that section, got to the Colorado trail, which in 2015, that section was cut out. You mm -hmm. went down the road. Mm -hmm. So it was like a little kind of frustrating on there, just trying to, there's a lot of people passing each other at that time. Yep. And so you had to kind of like stop or shuffle around each other. And so that kind of slowed me down a little bit. And then I got into Winfield and realized I'm, I was a little hungry. And then I noticed like, man, I feel like I'm wheezing. I'm not breathing that great. And so the climb up the backside of Hope, I mean, I was moving, but I wasn't passing anyone. Um, mm. And I was barely maintaining, keeping up with the people I was hiking up with. So mm. then I realized, you know, something's off. I'm not breathing very well. Um, we'll see what happens, but I got down in twin. I was able to run downhill, but then my, my breathing was still steadily getting worse. And by the time we got to power line, um, I was telling my pacer, you know, I can't, I'm like hyperventilating, walking up this hill, just mm. walking. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we were barely moving. Um, I was able to run down the road behind, um, power line down to like Hagerman. Mm -hmm. But then once everything was kind of like flat or rolling, I mean, I could jog for 30 seconds or so, and then I'd start just struggling breathing and I'd have to walk again. And it just became miserable. Um, when I left May Queen, I had, I think three hours and 50 minutes to get to the finish. And I told my pacer at May Queen, uh, it's gonna be really close and I'm not sure if we're going to make it just mm. to let you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, I will jog as much as I can, but it's, you know, I'm not moving very well and I don't feel good at all. I was trying to eat. I was getting down broth, like ramen noodles. Um, but, and I was starting to feel like that really full feeling when you're not really digesting anything mm. solid any longer. Yeah. And at some point after May Queen, I was like, man, I really feel like I'm leaning, like, you know, <laughs> um, but I had no idea, honestly, until I saw the video of me finishing, just like how bad it was. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, I could tell I was in rough shape, but, mm -hmm. um, when we got to the actual, um, you know, I was just like power hiking, jogging as much as I could. I saw like kind of the rock wall and I said, we're really close to the pavement. And I was like, how much time do we have left? And it was like 34 minutes. And I said, I think we'll make it. Um, it's about a mile once we, you know, get to the very top of this. But, you know, we still have a little bit of ways to hike to that. And then um, we got to the pavement and they're like, oh, you just have to hike to the top of this hill. And I'm like, no, that's, you know, and in my head, I'm saying to myself, no, once I get to the top of the hill, I know it goes down and then you go back mm -hmm, up again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was like one of the women who, I don't know if she was at the race or not, but she came up and was like, you got this, you're like so close, but you can make it. And they were telling me, you know, you have 14 minutes to go 0.8 miles. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Wow. Can... <laughs> um, but, you know, I just, they were asking me if I could run. I was like, no, you know, do you want water? I was like, no, I, I just, I just want to try to get there. Um, and then, of course, you crest the top of the hill and you can now see where the finish line is. Um, and so I was like, it's a downhill, I'll jog. So I handed my poles off to my friend Terry. And as soon as I handed him my poles, I was like, wow, I'm really leaning now. And I was like, started kind of jogging down the hill. And I was like, I'm really lightheaded. Everything feels numb. I was like, I'm going to pass out. And so I'm telling Terry, I think I'm going to pass out. And he's like, you can pass out in four minutes. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I like Terry. 
<laughs> so then I was like, then I started really panicking because I'm like, I really don't feel well. And I, I really do feel like I'm, I might just collapse. Mm. Um, so I asked for my poles back and then I started walking again. And of course this, this short little downhill, it's just, it's not very far. So at this point I've reached the bottom of it and I'm regrouping, telling myself, don't pass out, focus on walking toward the red carpet. You can see it like just walk as fast as possible. Um, and then I could hear like someone saying you have six minutes and I'm trying to, you know, you're trying to do ultra math. You're like, right. I walk, walk to there in six minutes. I'm not sure. <laughs> but then like, then all the whole crowd was like screaming and mm -hmm. cheering and everyone was like, you can do it. You can do it. And I was, it just kind of gave me this like little boost that I needed. Like, I was like, all right, as fast as possible, just push as fast as possible. And I was, you know, really trying to stride as much as I could. Um, yeah. And then once I could see the clock and I realized, okay, I can see the clock. It says 2957 something. And I only have to go to right there. Okay. Okay. You can relax. And then I was like, telling myself, make sure you step over the mat. Don't trip on the carpet. These are the things that are right. going <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, and then I step over the last timing thing. And I was like, you know, they put, she gave me the medal and I was like, I just need to sit down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone kind of stepped back and I sat down and then I was like, okay, okay, I'm here. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Um, but there were definitely, you know, people talking to me, like uh, Scott Coomer, who does the 10 Junk Miles podcast, came yeah. over and he's like, I felt like you didn't even recognize me. I was like, I recognized you. I just think I was just so like relieved to be done. Yeah. And there was like a lot going on around me that I, you know, I think I got distracted easily, but I was recognizing people, but I definitely, you know, felt really dizzy and I had to sit there for a good few minutes and drink some water. Um, they did bring me a PBR. So I had a couple sips of beer. Um, and then I said, okay, like, I think we should probably move. Um, so then they had to like help me up and I was like, all right, all right. I'm not going to pass out. Helped me to a chair, <laughs> sat there for another 30 minutes. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I was terrible. <laughs> was really terrible. Well, what do you think caused that at the end of the race for you, where it felt like you were going to pass out? And this also might be a novice question, but I, I genuinely don't know. Like, what is the ultra lean? Like, I've seen that in races before. Um, I don't even know what that is or what causes that. Yeah, it, they said they don't know, like, the exact cause per se, but it's usually due to, like, dehydration or, you know, some sort of, like, salt imbalance. And so, like, one set of muscles is working and the other isn't. And so Whoa. you like just tip over. Wow. Um, and I could, and I definitely could feel it, but it didn't, to me, I didn't feel like I was leaning as bad as what it looked like. Yeah. And um, I don't know who had like a couple people, like I, I Leadville 100 posted a video of the finish yeah. and I sent it to my mom and she, and she said, I couldn't even watch this. It was so terrible. <laughs> Like you were in so much pain. I was like, <laughs> crying. I was like it, it's not painful. I'm like, but you know, you don't, you're not thinking very clearly, obviously, because sure. I, I definitely had confused moments yeah. <laughs> as we were coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, you looked extremely determined. Let me tell you that. Like I saw you, you had your poles, you're moving. And it's just like, I just want to get across this thing. And it looked like I want to get across this thing so I can just like fall over and lay down almost. But yeah. um, do you know what caused, I mean, you mentioned it was like electrolytes or dehydration, but like what caused, do you think that's what caused your vision to go bad and for you to get dizzy? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and the other thing too, is just like struggling to breathe. I, I mean, I really was, I've never had my breathing mm. be affected like that. And so Honestly, I have no idea if it was the smoke or not, but I was wheezing. It was almost like having an asthma attack. Mm. Um, and after we finished and I, I sat around for a little bit, you know, we discussed potentially bringing me to urgent care, but I felt like, you know, I was able to move and I was comprehensive. So I was like, 
why don't I just go lay down and see, you know, if getting some rest helps. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend, Chris, I said, what about, you know, this sounds stupid, but what about like that canned oxygen you can get from the gas station? Should I try that? And so she, you know, they brought me back. I laid down. She brought me one of those cans and we're like, okay, we'll try it. And I mean, when I first took a couple pops off of it, I'm like, I don't notice anything, mm -hmm. but then I laid down and about 30 minutes later, I woke up just coughing like crazy. And I coughed up just a ton of like liquid oh, really? and yeah, it was just like kind of really thick, like green mucusy. <sighs> it was awful. And I did that for about 30 minutes. And then after that, I was like, oh okay, I can get a breath in. I'm going to be all right. And so I went back to sleep. I woke up to go to dinner, um, drank a bunch of water and then went back to bed for the rest of the night. Wow. And then like the ne next day was much improved, but so I don't know what, if I had like some of reaction to some allergen or what it was, but uh -huh. Uh -huh. it is like, I've never not been able to breathe like that. Wow. And you've never had that lean like that either, have you? No. <laughs> so that was a new really, one for you. Yes. <laughs> Are you scared of that coming into your future races? Or like, like I said, I'm naive to this thing. I don't really even know what it is. Is it something you worried about or where are you at? Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely worried because, you know, it's a short break before Wasatch. Wasatch has a lot of climbing. Um, it's not as high elevation though. Like the highest point is 10, four. So, I mean, that's just like the elevation of Leadville almost. Right. So, um, a lot of it's a little lower altitude. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit better about just having that on my side. And of course they have a 36 hour cutoff, which gives you the benefit of time. Okay. Um, and I do, you know, I usually do like those sort of like power hike for 3000 feet up and then kind of jog down the other side and do it again. And so I'm like really looking forward to Wasatch, but I am definitely nervous that I've physically pushed myself to where 20 days is not enough recovery, mm. but I'm trying really hard to get a lot of sleep and drink a lot of water and make sure I'm resting um, so that I'm as well prepared as I can be. <laughs> yeah, good, good. 36 hours. I mean, that should give you enough time to get it done, right? How much vertical is in Wasatch? Uh, it's just under 24,000. Wow. Okay. That's legit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've not done Wasatch before. I've done Bear 100, which is kind of in a similar area. Um, and I finished Bear in like 33.59 or something like that. So, okay. um, I'm feeling good about like, I'm targeting 35 hours. Yep. That's where I'd like to be yep. so that we don't have to feel like we're rushing to a cutoff. Um, or maybe I'll just be the slowest grand slammer ever in history. <laughs> hey, we'll take that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's still a grand slam. Still a grand slam. <laughs> oh man. Well, awesome, Gina. I mean, it sounds like a, a fantastic summer. Um, what a dream. So um, I know you have one race left, but congrats. You've made it three out of four so far. So just, you know how to do this last one. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yes. <laughs> well, that's cool. Um, are you looking at projects in the future? Do you have any idea what you're going to do next year or what the, the next big thing is? Um, well, I'm going to hopefully put in for hard rock. Um, assuming I finished Wasatch cause I do need a qualifier. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so hopefully, I mean, my chances of getting into hard rock last lottery, I think we're 4.5%. So, I mean, maybe I'll be closer to 10% this time <laughs> okay. I and mean, they do release the odds. So we'll, we'll find out. Um, and another thing on my radar is high five. I don't know if you've heard oh, yeah. Of that, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I've paced out there twice now. And okay. so I decided that it looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> now, don't you have to apply for that race and only like 20 or 30 people do it? I think they, uh, they, yeah, you do apply. I think 35 people are allowed to run a year. So, okay. and how do you get accepted for that? Is it just on your application? Do you have to like write a letter or write a school paper on why I want to get into this race? I think you do, you submit kind of like a running resume of what you've okay. done. Um, 
So uh, Stuart Cohen, I don't know if you know him. He's mm -hmm. paced me at a lot of stuff. He ran it two years ago and I paced him there. And then my friend Chris Grove did it this year and I paced her mm. um, during her section. So um, yeah, it looked like pretty cool. And I feel like knowing their running resumes, I have a reasonable chance of getting in in like a couple of tries maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, are those the only races that are kind of left on your list? Um, I what, mean, I think what does I your... am tough might be another interesting one. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you know, it's a hard rock qualifier, and I might be still trying to get in hard rock five years from now. Who knows? <laughs> right. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how about projects that aren't races? Do you have anything that's like rolling around in your head that you want to check off the list? Hmm. I'd like to go back to Italy. That mm. would be fun. And do what? Uh, maybe ski. Oh. I don't know. Do you ski? Yeah, I've been, I've got the icon pass now and they just added a oh. ski resort in Italy. So oh. I was like, that might be a good excuse to go ski in the Alps. There you go. That sounds all right. Yeah. yeah nice. Well, Good luck at Wasatch. I, I can't wait to hear about it. We're, we're cheering for you. I honestly don't think this will be out until after your race, but uh, good luck. It's, it's a cool journey. Um, the Grand Slam is, is nothing to sneeze at. That is legit. And uh, so you're just going to stamp yourself as even more of a badass than we thought you were before. So, Oh, no, I'm just a normal person <laughs> doing silly things. <laughs> Does this like translate to the rest of life for you? Like, you know, you learn how to do these ultras and like persevere through the hard stuff. Does it translate to like work life and the rest of life for you? I think it does. Cause I, I mean, I definitely get in situations where things aren't going well at work or projects are not going the way I want them to go. And I'll start melting down. I'll be like, Oh, you know how to get through this. You just gotta like suck it up buttercup mm -hmm. and just, plugging forward. So yeah. yeah. yeah Ultra runners does. can just put their heads down and grind. Like we're, we're all grinders. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, Gina, this has been awesome. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. And, uh, good yeah. luck to you. And, uh, I think it's like eight days, right? Yeah. So I leave, uh, on Wednesday of next week, I fly out and the race starts on Friday. So okay. I have Thursday to kind of chill out and relax. So Yep. That's crazy. I can't believe it's this close. Uh, it's so cool. What a cool summer. Well, I'm jealous. Uh, go do what you know you're supposed to do. Just one foot in front of the other. You got it, Gina. And, and no leaning. We don't want no any leaning, ultra yeah. leans. Yes. <laughs> no ultra leaning this time. Okay. Well, All good right. luck. Stay strong. I uh, can't wait to hear about it. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, cool, Adam. Cool, Gina. We'll see you. Have a great night. Yep. Right. You too. Bye.